Greetings. Um, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Eleo Skral. Uh, I'm, I'm with uh, Bitcoin University Ankara Computer Engineering Department. I'm trying to complete a delayed PhD program there. And I'm, I'm also the founder of, a, of an AGI company called, well, it's in Turkey, which is Spermetic RG. Well, today I'm not going to talk about AGI. I'm going to talk about brain simulations and so plot of the paper. Um, you might remember famous paper of Thomas Nagel uh, titled, What is it like to be a bat? In that paper, um, <coughs> Nagel concluded, well, we can't really know and there is no way to know. And this seems to show that uh, there is something really special about quality of experience, whatever. Uh, and that was the argument, if you remember. Well, uh, modern neuroscience seems to suggest that this problem can be approached technologically. For instance, uh, it might be possible to download uh, the brain circuitry corresponding to bats uh, sonar mod modality in a human, augmented in a human brain, and maybe the uh, human might know what it is like, well, what it is to, <coughs> what it's like to experience uh, sonar perception, and also um, following the recent methodology of reverse engineering uh, visual cortex, we might be able to build mo models of uh, a bat's uh, sensory perception areas, uh, sonar perception, and we might build a computer model of that. Uh, try to see what kind of information is in there actually. Uh, as some neuroscientists have decoded V1 area and uh, uh, try to find what a subject is presently seeing, experiencing uh, visual images, right? <clears throat> so, well, what about brain simulations? Um, a fundamental question in philosophy of mind is to understand uh, subjective experience, uh, to understand what it is like to uh, have uh, that raw sensory buzz, what it means physically or otherwise. Uh, how does this apply to brain simulations? Uh, brain simulations uh, are part of ongoing research in neuroscience. Uh, we have the uh, Human Brain Project, if it gets funded, it's supposed to be completed in mid-twenties. And we have uh, a lot of whole brain emulation projects and uh, brain scanning research ongoing. And there are present uh, brain simulation programs. And then a valid question to ask is, do these uh, brain simulation programs have any sort of experience at all? Or if they do, what sort of experience do they have? Um, and plausibly, uh, if we uh, make a brain simulation of you, you would like to know if that brain simulation is going to have the same level of experience or kind of experience that you have. Um, let me now refer to a, a brain prosthesis style experiment. I'm not sure who thought of it first, but it might be Minsky. Uh, uh, the thought experiment is, uh, is this. We gradually replace each neuron with a functional equivalent silicon neuron and electronic chip or device. Uh, Minsky and uh, his students at the time, uh, I think, uh, Morovich, thought that there would be no real change, uh, no change at all, no detectable change. Well, obviously, the behavior wouldn't change in that case, so the uh, system would be uttering the same sentences. So Minsky argues, uh, basing it on a, an argument that's much similar to Wittgenstein, Spittel in a box uh, thought experiment, that since uh, the statements involving consciousness and experience are identical, uh, we should conclude that the uh, system must have as much consciousness, the same kind of consciousness, that the human, uh, unaltered biological human has. 
So that's that's a somewhat convincing argument, but I think it might be um, it might be missing or ignoring some uh, some physical possibilities. Well, we'll get back to that later. And uh, John Searle suggested that <coughs> if we do this gradual replacement of neurons, uh, experience will vanish because, well, silicon computer chips <coughs> aren't the right stuff, basically. So what will happen is, as you're replacing the neurons one by one, your consciousness, your experience will fade <laughs> away, but you'll keep working. Uh, you'll be doing the same things as you did before, but your consciousness will sim sl simply cease to be, according to Sorrow. Um, this thought experiment is obviously very relevant uh, to the present paper. Uh, my idea is that both of these suggestions are probably extreme claims that do not really uh, depend on what we empirically know or what we are certain of. So they are really speculations. They are not things that either party could really know, I believe. Um, and now we're, uh, you know, I think, in a much better position to uh, cast the question. Well, uh, there is a debate going on, um, as I'm sure you're perfectly aware of. Uh, in philosophy of mind, most people like to uh, argue about uh, qualia and free will, obviously, because those seem to be unresolved questions. And also because uh, they seem to be, for some reason, subjectively important uh, to the debaters. And, uh, and again, as I'm sure you're per uh, perfectly aware of, there are many dualist wireless objections to machine consciousness. As there are some dualist supporters of machine consciousness as, uh, too. Uh, but their idea is usually like Penrose thinks that um, there is some uncomputable quantum process that we would like to call free will, or or that um, some some of all the others think that mental predicates can't possibly be reduced to physical explanations, physical statements. Um, but I'm not so sure how much those suggestions have helped improve our understanding of the matter at all. I think they have contributed exactly nothing. Most of those ideas are uh, attempts to avoid thinking about the uh, matter. They are non-explanations rather than explanations. And in most cases, I found them to be arguments from ignorance. So, well, we, we don't know what's really going on, so we'll assume that nobody can know them or can answer them. It's convenient, of course. Uh, instead, I, I want to um, think about this problem in the context of strong physicalism, which is a very simple idea. It's an inductive idea that we've reached through physical sciences, the immense success of physical sciences. It's, it's, it can be ca uh, stated as every event, state, <coughs> property, process, whatever, is strictly physical. There is nothing else to it. Um, and uh, if you think about recent work in neuroscience, such as, well, cybernetic visual implants, the stuff that uh, take, take camera input and feed it right back into the visual cortex, uh, brain-machine interfaces, all sorts of devices that let people control uh, prostheses or other devices, um, let monkeys uh, control virtual mouses, uh, and transcranial magnetic stimulation, artificial retina that was recently devised, uh, all sorts of fMRI studies, 
the, uh, a, the one I mentioned earlier, the decoding of V1, uh, while predicting the number of objects in a subject is currently thinking of uh, through fMRI data. These are all in support of a very strong kind of physicalism with respect to neuroscience. So, well, my idea was, I mean, my observation was that most analytical philosophers who still favor those extremely superstitious ideas like non-reductionism are probably unaware of the empirical work that's been going on. You know, I, I really do think so, and, uh, and maybe we can argue about that later. So I'll ask the question. Does a brain stimulation of, an, uh, of a meat brain A, and there is a brain stimulation code B, well, does B have experience at all? And how similar is this to human experience? Is there a way to quantify that? First of all, let me tell you, well, the, the answer is not empirically determined yet. We don't have a precise answer. So what we can do is to, is to explore space of scientifically plausible explanations. And, uh, well, this is a snapshot of a work by Izikiewicz and Edelman uh, there. Uh, they had a brain simulation program. There are such programs. Did this program at the time experience anything at all? Some philosophers would say, well, uh, neuroscientists can't answer that. My idea, I think they should be able to answer it. They should be encouraged to try to answer it. So let, let's uh, go to some other uh, approach uh, to philosophy of mind. Um, it's it's pan-experientialism. Pan-experiential usually not favor so much in analytical philosophy circles because it looks like a pretty superstitious idea. Uh, the claim is that experience is a basic capability of every physical resource. So if that's true, uh, the basic, uh, this basic condition or uh, potential of experience is all around us. It's in any, any kind of matter. And, and then uh, the, the kind of subjective experience we have it is obviously part of causal picture of it. it was causally connected uh, to the brain. Uh, it can't be something uh, that's detached from it, ghost-like. It can't be that. And uh, and then we arrive at the conclusion that only f uh, while all of it has the potential, only physical resources organized in the right way could be called intelligent or conscious. So, well, could a global plasma be experiencing anything? Obviously, that's just, well, random, random stuff going on. So it's not intelligent, it's not conscious, but it could be said to have some kind of pro-experience if we accepted pan-experientialism. The uh, pan-experientialism could be thought of uh, as compatible with physicalism. At least Straussian thinks that Physicalism entails pan experientialism, and as we'll see, uh, a lot of uh, scientific hypotheses about experience may be considered some form of pan experientialism. Um, and I'd like to talk a little bit about my evil alien thought experiments. Suppose that an evil alien arrives at your house while they're asleep and he shuffles all the uh, neural connections in your brain randomly. Uh, well, obviously, much of your intelligence and memory would vanish. Uh, the information would be meaningless, the computations well, random. But we could argue on the basis of neurophysiology that the basic, uh, whatever basic physical uh, resources uh, that are part of experience would still be functional and there would be some experience. But 
well, it would obviously be meaningless and uncognitive. It would be, it would not be conscious experience anymore. So this, um, this is a, a fluid experiment designed to convince you that consciousness, the concept of consciousness, is likely quite independent <laughs> of the uh, of human experience, the physical conditions for human experience. Uh, subjective experience should be considered is a peculiar particular property should be considered part of human consciousness but without the higher order cognitive functions like reasoning prediction uh, perception awareness learning uh, self uh, reference etc we can't really say that a system is conscious at all uh, the uh, cognitive functional properties of the system are much more important and m probably much harder to get than uh, uh, subjective experience itself. Uh, now let's um, mention a scientific hypothesis about experience. This is um, this was advanced by uh, William Bailey's team in one of their papers. Uh, I'll try to uh, tell the reference, okay, uh, in a while. Uh, well, they said, they said that um, experience is determined by neural code, uh, spike train. So each, each particular spike train corresponds to a specific experience. And of course, uh, this can be extended to uh, ensembles of neurons in the obvious way. Uh, wh what they've shown is that neural codes evolve differently, substantially differently, very differently in different individuals. So they measured the uh, spike trains of the same neuron in the fruit fly, the H1 neuron uh, that detects, that's known to detect rigid but horizontal motion. Uh, and they found that in different flies, exactly the same uh, stimulus uh, resulted in very different spike patterns. Uh, therefore, the researchers conclude the experience should, uh, should vary radically from individual to individual. This would mean that my brain is very different from your brain if they are right. So this is a scientific hypothesis. There would obviously be ways to verify this further or falsify it. And let's try to consider what would happen if we change the spike train. Well, the chemical uh, transmission across the chemical snaps, that would change. Any electromagnetic fields uh, associated with the uh, spike train, that would change. And actually, computation changes because data changes. The spike train is the data, data changes, computation changes. So actually, there's a lot of physical change going on. And uh, this seems to support the hypothesis that experience would change. And here is the, uh, the paper. Is, uh, you can find the uh, reference, Schneidman and others, 2001. It's neural code variation. Um, I don't know if uh, you can see it, but these are different flies. They have, uh, they have nine flies, and those are, uh, that's time, and those are uh, spike trains. You can see how different the patterns are. They are different both uh, at the macro scale and micro scale. They are quite different. The, the spike words are also substantially different. They are very different distributions. They've used the same random stimulus to feed the H1. So, well, uh, this is the kind of research that could lead to a very deep understanding of experience in animals. Uh, now, now that we have seen one kind of scientific hypothesis, maybe we could try to, to determine the uh, scientific criteria for uh, 
an experience hypothesis that could work. <coughs> what should the scientists find? I think, first of all, they should concentrate, obviously, on sufficient and necessary conditions for experience to occur. You can vary the conditions, you can keep one of them, change one of them, and see how the experience changes. This could, pro with some work, could probably be carried over to human subjects even. Although it's a bit of a difficult. Um, the other question I would like them to answer is how can a particular experience be reproduced in another brain or another machine? I would like them to answer which physical events are part of experience, mariologically part of it. And they should be able to tell us if chemical interactions or quantum computation is part of experience. If there is any uh, peculiar physics going on in uh, experience. And, uh, and they should be able to tell us uh, how the uh, informational content of uh, experiences physically encoded. Where does it lie? Is it in uh, electrical signals? Is it in a, or is it in an electromagnetic field that pervades the whole <laughs> brain tissue? Where is it? Because if you come to think of it, if your experience didn't contain any information, then it couldn't contain any words, pictures, uh, anything that's meaningful whatsoever, right? So it's quite important to understand how uh, the information in your subjective experiential space gets encoded in the brain, precisely. <coughs> now, uh, so, depend uh, so if we make a scientific hypothesis like that, we expect the neuroscientists to be able to, to tell us uh, whether these experiences are the same as A, different from A, or non-existent. Uh, Pan experientialism seems to suggest to us, for instance, that the different uh, the experience, if we assumed it as a scientific hypothesis, of course, not as a metaphysical assumption, uh, then experience should most likely change radically. You can uh, think of this as um, with an uh, with an analogy. Tra consider transfer of 35 millimeter film to digital format. What has changed? Uh, we, we like to think that information has remained constant, but almost everything about uh, the film has changed. There's uh, 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 there are all kinds of material changes. Likewise with the brain stimulation. Uh, almost all one minute is too bad I don't have it much. <laughs> so what has changed? Data representation based computation, computer architecture, and almost all their physical states are different from the original brain. So only computational equivalence remains, which means that uh, while the uh, simulation cannot subjectively detect these differences, may not realize them. Uh, there are vast uh, changes in the fabric of experience and there should be qualitative changes actually. And further questions uh, that I'd like to, to you to consider and you can find some further discussion on these on the, on the, in the paper. Uh, what is the right level of simulation for functional equivalence? Um, how much does biological medium contribute to experience? And does experience depend on any uncanny uh, physics, like quantum coherence? We have uh, some answers from both general physicalist and pan experientialist perspective. I'm not going into these uh, right now, but uh, I'm just going to say that um, Tolonis' hypothesis of uh, qualia seems to be pan experientialist in nature. And uh, actually, uh, the EM field, quantum computation field, is also seem to be a kind of restricted pan experientialism, if you think about it. 
has some consequences. Well, if, as I said, if pain expression is true, the, uh, this experience radically changes. If the EM field uh, hypothesis is true, that is, uh, subunitism mostly an EM field property, you need special hardware to reproduce exactly the experiential states. If you miss them, the uh, simulation or prosthesis device might lack subjective uh, properties altogether. And uh, if quantum computation physics is correct, you need a uh, you probably need a universal quantum computer or, or a quantum computer of some sort to implement a subjective experience. But each Mako computer would have a very different kind of subjective experience then, because it would depend on whether you're using electron spins or gluons or some other uh, quantum uh, state. And if just electrical signals are required, PCs already have experience but of a very different texture than the brain, because obviously they're running Linux or something, not, uh, not the neural code. Thank you. Uh, if, if you have any questions, I'd like to take them now. It seems like time experimentalism is doing all the heavy lifting in uh, your talk. You're assuming it, and then all the conclusions kind of come up, but you have no arguments in your talk for it. For example, the evil alien experiment would show that, well, in a pan experimentalist universe, consciousness is not linked to experience. But if you don't buy pan experimentalism, the alien uh, the thought experiment doesn't show anything in particular. Oh. Okay, well, I think uh, the evil alien thought experiment doesn't depend on pan experientialism. But uh, uh, if you, I don't buy pan experientialism, the evil no, alien you don't have will to... most likely just erase my experience whatsoever. Well, uh, okay. <clears throat> uh, if pan experientialism is false, and that might be the case because it's just a hypothesis, it's just a general, hy a general physical hypothesis, really or a general neuroscience hypothesis. If we disregard it, uh, then uh, we, we can still uh, try to use a general theory, like uh, information theory or algorithmic or quantum information theory, to try to, to quantify the subjective contents of experience. Uh, what does this depend on? I think the uh, the, the only assumption that you do really need, and well, which is well supported by physical science, is reductive physicalism, and nothing more than that. So, the, uh, not all uh, physical systems may have subjectivity, subject, those subjective properties, but only a subset of them. And then, what will be the most uh, plausible uh, hypothesis that a particular physical kind or, or particular f uh, set of kind of physical processes lend themselves to experience. So that wouldn't be pan experientialism, oh. but, but, it, it, but general physicalism is still quite similar to pan experientialism in that regard. So that would be an answer. And the, the other answer is that. Well, well, we should uh, an experientialism. I did suggest first because it seems to be the simplest hypothesis that we didn't explicitly disprove, that we couldn't yet falsify. So it would be nice if we could somehow falsify it. For instance, in humans, this would be be quite easy to falsify. If quantum coherence is a necessary condition then we can find a way to chemically alter the brain to prevent or modify quantum coherence and then we should see some experiential changes. But wouldn't that just be consciousness changes? Excuse me? Wouldn't that just be change in consciousness? You're, you're separating consciousness from experience with your evil alien thought experiment. No, I'm, I'm not uh, uh, really separating them. I'm just saying that consciousness isn't comprised of subjectivity. Subjectivity is the wrong tool to try to understand consciousness. Instead, 
judgment, belief, cognition are better methods to try to understand uh, consciousness because it's ultimately uh, the functional properties of the uh, cognitive architecture that matter in this case, I think. Uh, or okay. I'm, I agree okay. with Bennett on that. Uh, okay, we, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, we can uh, continue this debate for thank you for your question. We have one more question here. So, um, so let's suppose you have a brain simulation of some uh, normal brain, and you make a simulation of the simulation. Will the two simulations have the same experience or not? Uh, I, uh, well, from uh, both the general physicalist perspective and pun experientialist perspective, no, I think not. It would just this would just simply amplify uh, physical differences further. Yeah, I just want to clarify something I'm not sure I heard right, but the neural code hypothesis, if I understand, I'm paraphrasing this back, you can tell me if I'm full blind. The neural hypothesis, neural code hypothesis combined with actual sampling of spike trains, these people, Schneidman and all, said, therefore, Two people's experience of looking at the same picture will yeah, be radically different. Yeah, must be quali there must be some qualitative difference. They do suggest that. If I remember correctly, but you should read their paper, which is incredibly well written and interesting. Good, thank you. Okay, we have to move on now. So we're going to move on to the third talk of this session.